Wonderful. Are y'all ready to go? Get the Zoom recording set up. How's my volume, by the way? Can y'all hear me over the air conditioning? Okay. So, last Sunday, I apologize for this. We had uh, an SDETV crew coming in for this special thing that we did at the 11 o'clock service. I got pulled away, so we weren't able to do this installment. That means we all will be here this morning, so we're doing a little bit of uh, backtracking. Um, if you recall from last time, we talked about the mission to the north. Is everyone somewhat familiar with uh, that part of what we talked about? So we're picking up essentially with the mission to the north. Hopefully by the end of today, we'll be through um, St. Wilfred. It's a lovely character. So onward we go. A bit of review. In the year 635, Oswald, who's the king of the Northumbrians, wins a battle in a place called Heavenfield and establishes himself as the sort of the, the dominant king in the north. He is a Christian. He has been trained by Irish monks over in Ireland. Um, we don't exactly know where, but he assumed he sort of traveled around a number of different places. When he becomes the king in the north, he calls over to the Irish to have them send him some monks to help him proselytize the northern kingdom that he is the king of. They send him a guy named Aiden. Oswald grants Aiden the island of Lindisfarne, which is the base that Christianity will have as it begins to spread in that region. Um, and it remains a very powerful place uh, of, of prayer, of pilgrimage, almost from the, from the outset, from its beginnings. For those who are going on the pilgrimage trip that we'll have in September, this is one of the stops that we'll be making. So we'll be going over to the island of Lindisfarne and exploring there a little bit. Yes. So this, this is the far north of England. In terms of the country England, it is about the farthest north that you can go before you reach the border of Scotland. So if you see a sort of modern map of Scotland, you go over to the North Sea, you look down at this most southern, southeastern most point of Scotland, Holy Island or Lynn's Forest, right there. Okay. So um, this is the place that will be the, the sort of the launching point for much of what happens in the church in the north for a very long time. So that's kind of a, a bit of a refresher from last time. As the church gets established. And this is again from 635. So Oswald comes in, he's a Christian king, he begins to, to help the spread of Christianity. The way that Christianity spreads in this region, and much of the, the Celtic areas that we're talking about, is through monasticism. Monastic communities get established, and that's what helps spread the faith. Now, none of these, not a single one of the, the one, the buildings that are pictured here are original Celtic, Anglo-Saxon, early English even, establishments. These are all sort of Gothicized buildings that were put up in these places. But we have a fascinating, you know, these are just a few examples of some of the places where the ruins show how long-lasting the Christian witness is in these areas. So Whitby, which is probably the most famous one we've heard of, um, there is a, I think the, the, the Abbey ruin dates to the 14th century. But it starts humble beginnings, you know, Anglo-Saxon architecture, and then winds up becoming a major house, a major center of, of worship and monastic spirituality. And to this day, it means fairly impressive. I would not recommend that you ever go to Whitby because it is a tourist trap. That would be like someone saying, well, you should definitely go to Myrtle Beach. It's the best. Um, it, is, it is the Myrtle Beach. Bram Stoker. Yeah. So, so it's a sort of whaling. 
Oh, yeah, no, it's it's an important place, but it's just it now it's sort of it's uh it's a it's a tourist trap, very much so, which is unfortunate because it really is beautiful. But you got Hartlepool, um, Naviersburg, and Holdingham, Ripon. These are all sort of foundations that are that are begun in very sort of humble ways. Hartlepool becomes the the one of the foundations of Hilda Whitby. Hilda who winds up going to Whitby. She starts her career off near Hartlepool, and there's still this day a large, massive parish church in Hartlepool. Um, Naviersburg. <laughs> St. Fursa, and there's a that's a Roman fort that, that has still a functioning parish church. Coldingham is a mon monastic ruin, um, and Ripon, which is a minor cathedral. All of these places they have these humble Christian beginnings, you know, monastic communities of maybe 10, 15 people. Um, they wind up becoming centers of pilgrimage, centers of prayer, and centers of power for the church as it spreads in the north. So this becomes key as we get further in and, and to start discussing uh, Synod of Whitby. So does anyone know what this image is? Anyone care to wager a guess? <laughs> it looks like a calendar, very good. Any guesses to what it might be a calendar of? <laughs> yes. Okay, so calendars, and I know this is going to sound incredibly dry and dull, but calendars, how do we tell time? How do we know when the date of Easter is? Does anyone know when the date of Easter is? Some of the days after the first. It's first. The first Sunday after the first full moon in the Okay. Okay. So we have that information now, but 1,300 years ago, it was not really that simple. In fact, you have a prayer book with you. If you turn to the back of your prayer book, there's a, there's a section of it called Tables for Finding. You've got a criminal, so it's sort of more towards the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's called Tables for Finding Holy Days, and it's a number of pages that goes through how you calculate the date of Easter. Let's see if we can. Okay, so table. We begin on page 880 or 881. So this is stuff that really is only for kind of specialists, but if you get bored during the sermon, and yeah, I really can't do the research, this stuff um, becomes incredibly important because if you're operating with a solar calendar or a lunar calendar, chances are you're going to come up with some different dates. So how does Passover get calculated? How do we know when Passover is? Okay, and what is the Hebrew calendar based on? It's lunar. It's lunar. It's so, it's, so well, Passover, Passover always begins in the 14th day of the month of Nisan, which is their sort of the, the first month of their year. So, and that's that dates back to Exodus. It's the four, the 14th day of the month, month of Nisan. So, how do we figure out what the date of Easter is? Do we go with the lunar Jewish calendar or do we go with the solar calendar, Gregorian calendar, again, and sort of calculate how days, months, weeks pass based on the cycles of the sun or the Earth's rotation around the sun? Revolution. So this becomes a live issue because if you've got a church, a group of people that want to celebrate Easter, which is the principal feast of the church year, it is the feast of the resurrection. And you've got half the room saying, well, I think we should probably just do it on the 14th day of the, the lunar month of the sun. And you got the other half saying, no, actually, we need to calculate this based on when the, the uh, vernal equinox is and find when the Sunday after that is. We're going to have two groups of people celebrating Easter at a completely different time. It doesn't always overlap. <laughs> Not 
Not necessarily. Not necessarily. So, and then this becomes a very live issue around the time of the council of So, and actually, people that, that were were dedicated to saying, no, the 14th day of the month of Nisan is when we ought to celebrate Easter, we're condemned as heretics. It's, this is this is serious business for Britain, right? So that that controversy still sort of percolates down, but there are different ways of calculating the date of Easter. I'm not going to go into how complicated this gets, but basically you've got two systems at work in the Celtic, in the Celtic world, you've got one tradition that basically says there's the 14th day of the month of the sun. Let's celebrate it on Sunday after that. And then you've got the Roman tradition, which says, no, actually, on the first Sunday, after the first full moon of the Vernal Equinox, that's when we need to celebrate. I think the Orthodox go with this called the Celtic calculation. It's closer to it. That's You might know more about that. No, it's, it's sometimes it's actually quite close. In fact, the, the controversy that crops up in the Celtic versus Roman church, it's not big. So it, 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 it's sort of the same thing that I'm talking about. You better say the Greeks say the million But the difference on Yes, what, what the Greeks do is, is technically speaking more close to what the Celts did, but is they're 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 going with a system that's sometimes our, our Easter's overlap with the Greek Orthodox Easter, but not always. And that's what happened in the Celtic versus Roman world. Sometimes Easter overlapped, but a lot of times it didn't. You know, a week or two difference. But that's I'd have, I'd have to be interested in people looking into what the, what the Greek Orthodox, um, how they get there. But for the, for the purposes of this conversation, the difference between how the Celtic Church calculated the date of Easter and how the Roman Church calculated the date of Easter meant that we wound up having two different celebrations of Easter in the same year. Not always, but in, uh, close enough that it caused some problems, especially when you've got a Kentish Roman princess coming up north to marry a king who is Celtic. So Celtic observance is happening in the royal household, and the Roman observance is happening a week or two later in the same household. Uh-oh. Bede says this is a big problem. It's not that big a problem. It's kind of blowing things out of the out of the um, portion. But when you've got King Oswald, who has studied over in Ireland, who has brought in an Irish monk to spread Christianity in the north of England, what do you think is going to wind up happening? Those Irish monks, those Celtic traditions are going to be imbibed by the northern Christians. And so they're going to observe the Celtic calculation of the date of Easter. Well, this becomes a problem. Because you have the Roman traditions also sort of migrating up from the south. So this leads to a bit of a kerfuffle. <laughs> this is what Bede has to say. And this is this is Bede, who is an incredibly partisan supporter of the Roman position of the calculation of the data beast. In fact, you could say that Bede has an axe to grind and only one axe beyond Jesus is Lord, it's Easter. This, this is the big thing for me. Here's what he has to say about Aiden. While Satan lived, the difference about the observance of Easter was patiently tolerated by all, for they well knew that though he could not keep Easter contrary to the custom of those who had sent him, yet he industriously, like, industriously labored to practice the works of faith, piety, and love according to the custom of all holy men, for which he was deservedly beloved by all. So, B, on the one hand, has got... I want to make sure that everybody knows what the proper calculation of the date of Easter is. And Aiden is a holy guy. How do you mix the two? He tries to thread the needle. I do not approve or pray, or pray or praise his observance of Easter at the wrong time. So he's wrong. This is wrong. Either through ignorance of the canonical appointed. Time appointed, or if he knew it, 
being prevailed upon by the authority of his nation not to adopt. Yet this I approve in him, that in the celebration of his Easter, the object which he had at heart and reverence and preached was the same as ours, to wit, the redemption of mankind, the passion, resurrection, and ascension of heaven into heaven of the man Christ Jesus. So, again, main source of information about this controversy is Bede. He is incredibly partisan, and even he has to admit the Irish observance, there's holiness on their side. In fact, almost all of the sort of main players in this beat has nothing negative to say about their personalities. He's just saying they're just wrong. They're just wrong. Get the date of Easter correctly calculated. So this leads to the Synod of Whitby, which again was a minor thing. Bede sort of gives it this, this major glossy uh, appearance of a, of a huge conference. It's not. It's a sort of minor church conference. But it does have very wide ramifications. Now, the Synod of Whitby takes place in... <laughs> pronounce how it's actually pronounced. I'll give you a dollar. Um, um, it's in Whitby. And the abbess who hosts it is a member of the royal household of the, the Northumbrian kingdoms. And she brings together all of these people. They decide they want to have this council at Whitby. And at Whitby, you see church politics at its absolute best because you've got two very powerful figures in the king, and the son, and they're sort of at loggerheads in terms of how do you calculate the date of Easter. But the king is not in favor of the Celtic, uh, or, sorry, is not in favor of the Roman observance. And most of the major magnates that are there also not in favor of the Roman observance. They're used to how, they're been, how they've been doing things. The Celtic calculation of Easter is the big deal. Next, we'll go back. But the king's son, Alfred, Alfred has a protege or one of his allies, a guy by the name of Wilfred. <coughs> Wilfred according to B, stands up and gives this wonderful, just amazing presentation of why the Roman customs are right. Basically, the argument that Wilfred makes at the end of the day is, St. Peter holds the keys to heaven. If you want to get in heaven, you might want to go with Peter. Peter's in Rome. And that wins. That's how B sort of presents the argument. Now, we can go into all the sort of, you know, the political happenings behind it. But the outcome of the Synod of Whitby is that the Roman observance of Easter is declared to be the normative practice and should be the normative practice for the entire church in England, done. This upsets quite a lot of people. Um, in fact, most of the monks who had gone over to Lindisfarne go back. They're just like, we're, we're out, we're going to go back to Ireland. Um, a lot of the places that have been populated by Celtic monasteries, Celtic monastic foundations, they also say, we're out, we're gone. Um, as a result of the Synod of Whitby, Wilfred Good. Wilfred is granted a monastery or two. I know. Uh, the king's son, Alfred. So, Alfred grants him this, you know, he gives him a monastic uh, community. He says, you're going to be the abbot because the power structure is the king gets to the point who he wants to be the abbot. Wilfred goes into a monastery called Melrose and wants to enforce Roman customs in Melrose. The abbot of that monastery decides to leave, to go back to his original monastery, along with one of his uh, protégés by the name of Cuthbert. So Cuthbert winds up getting exiled from his original home monastery. This winds up being helpful. We'll get there in a second. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about Wilfred, because we're going to on this trip to, to the north, <laughs> the north of England, we're going to go be we're going to go see a couple of places. That Wilfred is directly responsible for founding, setting up. Excuse me. So, after the Synod of Whitby, <laughs> King's son Alfred wants him to be ordained bishop, bishop of Lindisfarne, essentially bishop of Northumbria, and sends him to be ordained in Gaul, honor day, France. Wilfred takes his sweet southern time to get there and back. 
It takes well over a year, all of this to sort of take place. Now, if you send someone off to get a remand, expecting them to return, and they're gone, you haven't heard anything from them, what do you think is going to happen? Someone else gets a point. So the king and his son have a little bit of a falling out. The king says, guess what? I'm going to appoint someone else. He appoints someone else. The king's son leads a failed revolt against his father, and a new bishop is ordained in his stead. So Wilfred comes back. He's bishop now. I'm expecting to come into my diocese to gray a plum. Well, sorry. Someone else has actually taken the position because you were gone for a year. He appeals. And a lot of this, and again, you know, B sort of glosses over some of the ugly details in Wilfred's life by uh, a different guy named Eddie Stephanus. There's a little bit more of the ugliness and nasty politics involved in it, during which Wilfred is the absolute hero of everything. He gets his appeal heard by the Archbishop of Canterbury. His appeal is uh, approved. Archbishop of Canterbury re gets him reinstated. He goes back up north to his diocese. You'd think that that's all well and good. Actually, no. The Archbishop of Canterbury reinstates him and wants to break his diocese up because I think I said this earlier. The Diocese of Northumbria is massive. It basically yeah. runs from the river uh, uh, Humber all the way up to the southern parts of Scotland. It's an immense geographical area. And so Theodore wants to break up that massive diocese so that it's a little bit easier to manage by several people. Well, you think that Wilfred is happy with that? No. He makes another appeal. He gets exiled. He, he appeals all the way up to Rome. Rome says, actually, Wilfred's got a case. You can't break up his diocese without his consent. He goes back in to, to Northumbria. The king at the time is, he basically says, I don't care what Rome has to say. I'm going to ignore him. And he goes into exile again. Comes back in after another appeal to Rome. Is exiled again. Anyway, you see all this. He goes to Rome a lot. <laughs> this becomes important because in the church of Hexa, there's a crypt. This dates to the seventh century. So this is in the 600s now. And you've got this, this wandering, wandering, this rambunctious traveling bishop who goes to Rome, sees some of the sites in Rome, especially the catacombs, is so wowed by it that he decides he wants to actually go back to England and reconstruct a version of these catacombs in one of his churches, which he then does. That catacomb is still extant. You can go down and see it, which is kind of, I think that's kind of neat. You've got a 7th century network that was constructed by one of these figures that we can still go and see. Like, he's directly responsible for that. that, that that's pretty neat. Um, after all these appeals, after many sort of ugly fights with local magnates and other folks, um, which involve in one instance um, he and his followers getting out of a boat and being attacked by East Anglians, I think, and then cutting all of the East Anglians down. So this is not just, you know, sort of a passive uh, pacifist bishop. This guy is willing to go get his hands dirty. Um, he winds up Winning his appeals and has granted two foundations, the foundations of Ripon and Hexham, and that's guys. So he has been an incredibly controversial figure in entire life. This becomes important when we start talking about Cuthbert. Um, the other figure at the Synod of Whitby is Hilda. <clears throat> if you've been into the church, y'all know the women's window in the cathedral? Yeah. So Hilda of Whitby is one of the figures in the women's window, which is right next to the Gary Chapel. At the back, you're on the you're walking in off of Wentworth Street, it's over to the left, and there's a, the women's window. I think that's the most modern window in the church. Is that right? 1960s? Anyway, so Hilda of Whitby, a little bit of background on her. So King Edwin, the first Christian king of Northumbria, it's his great niece. She's in the court of Edwin and was baptized. <laughs> oh, um, was baptized with Edwin's court on Easter Day in the year 627. Um, when the 
nasty Mercians overrun the kingdom of Northumbria and kill King Edwin. She flees down south with Edwin's now widow, Ethelberga, and she said Ethelberga sets up a nunnery. It's presumed that Hilda begins her monastic life with Ethelberga in this nunnery. We don't really know anything about what she does until about the age of 33. The age of 33, this is where her story picks back up, according to Bede. And Bede says that she comes back to Northumbria because Aiden requests that she come back and found a nunnery. She decides to do so. She's in Hartlepool for a very short time, and then she's off to Whitby to found the monastic community in Whitby, which is also the original name of Whitby is Strionoslach. Someone with a better background in Old English can probably help me with that one. But Whitby is one of these double monasteries that comes out of the Celtic tradition, which means you've got some small houses that maybe house two, three uh, cells. The men and the women live separately. So it's, it's both sexes are in the monastery. They worship together. They live apart. And typically... The abbess, and it normally is a woman in charge of the of, of the foundation. Um, it it is under the rule of an abbess. Whitby becomes one of these double monasteries in the Celtic tradition, and it houses a flock of very important figures who go on to be big players in the church. There are no less than five bishops who work directly under Hilda of Whitby. And so, in terms of the the formation that this one foundation has and it's the, the importance of the north of England. It's massive. Massive. So, again, she's renowned for her wisdom and energy. Kings regularly seek her counsel. And that's partially because she comes from the royal line. So she's very well connected in the royal family, which is why when the Synod of Whitby is called together, it, the natural place to hold it is Whitby. Because you've got the, the niece or the grandniece of a king who is the head of this monastic community. Where else would you want to, want to go? You know, the, you've got church and state coming together quite nicely. So, I had you. So, one of the other issues that was at stake the Council of Whitby, the Senate of Whitby, beyond Easter, has to do, you know, in terms of the difference between Roman observance and Celtic observance, is how monks are going to cut their hair. This is not that big a deal. But it's kind of, I find it rather fascinating that you've got a difference, sort of a difference in, in the way that things are done, that there's you know, a haircut that identifies you as a monk that becomes something of a flashpoint. You've got different monks with different haircuts wandering around. Like, well, I've got a crown. I'm with Rome. I've got a whatever that is. Um, what's the abbot's wherever on the left? What's, what's that? What's the abbot's wherever on the left? That's the Celtic tantra. It's just basically it's 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 you're shaving the front part of your head, or maybe leaving a, a small little you know there's a wedge, but it, it usually involves shaving the front and the. Roman tonsure is your shaving the top, creating a crown. So that's another one of these issues that uh, crops up. I love the artwork in here because the Celts all just, they look very sort of, oh, maybe it's well lovely. We're, we're, we're happy. And the Romans just all look miserable. You know, especially this guy on the bottom here. So, that all sort of gets sorted out at the Synod of Whitby. Um, I do want to bring this up because also at Whitby, the foundation of Whitby, this is where I wish Frith were here. If she could read this. Um, at the monastery of Whitby, <laughs> under Hilden, there is a cowherd by the name of Kate Mott, or Pat, who is relatively uneducated, 
has never learned to, to play any instrument, has never been taught the art of composition, and is a relatively unimportant figure in the, the, the Whitby Foundation. He's not a monk. He's sort of a worker at the monastery who, who helps keep the cows, but he's not a monk. And he's the story, as the story that B tells goes, one night sitting around um, with some, of, some of his compatriots, and they're passing around a, a lute or a harp. And say, hey, you know, sing a song for us. And everyone's kind of passing the harp around and at least able to put something together, a couple of notes, whatever. And it comes to him and he says, I can't, I can't do anything. And he goes away sort of in dismay. As the story goes, he has a dream where he encounters an unnamed person. It's an angel. <clears throat> and the angel basically says, you are going to now sing about creation. He protests, I can't, I'm not have the gift. First, this angelic figure persists and says, you will sing me a song of the wonders of creation. He proceeds to do so. Writes it down, manages to um, have, I guess you'd call it a miraculous intervention, intervention where he's given the gift of, of music, composition. He goes and talks to Hilda. She um, calls in some scholars, some other people who basically verify this guy was an illiterate peasant, did not have any skill, and now all of a sudden he's able to compose these hymns. And he goes on to, to compose. B tells us uh, numerous hymns, but we only have the text one. This is one of the earliest surviving examples of old English that we have. This, you know, the, the English translation, such as it is, is over on the right there. Um, I'll read through it real quick because it's one, there's one little uh, phrase in there that actually winds up becoming more influential than you could imagine. Now we shall honor heaven, heaven kingdom's ward, the measurer's might, his mind plans, the work of the glory father, as he of each wonder, eternal Lord, the origin established, basically saying God created the world, right? He first created for the children of men, heaven for a roof, holy shaper. Then middle earth. Well, how about that? Thank you, Tolkien. Uh, mankind's Lord, eternal Lord, after created the lands for men, Lord Almighty. So again, this relatively obscure figure living in a, a Celtic monastery writes these hymns, writes, writes these, these verses. Um, and one line is picked up by a 20th century author and turned into Middle Earth, Frodo and all those, all, all those things. So, so um, the way that, that Cadman's life sort of comes to an end, it's, uh, he spends the rest of his life in the monastery of Whitby. And as Bede tells us, sort of he realizes, and he's fairly young, he's probably in his uh, early 50s. Life expectancy back then is not that great. Um, he realizes he's about to die, basically asks to have the viaticum or the uh, Holy Eucharist brought to him. He receives it. And all of his brothers are going, you're not even sick. Why are you asking to have this brought to you? And dies like as soon as he receives me. Strange. So yes. And then I have to, I have to tell this. So, so one of the things, and this is um I think I might have mentioned this up front that when we start talking about the Celtic tradition, it is not always the sort of romanticized version of you know, nature and femininity and, and peace and love that, that some people give it. It is not always like that. So, case in point, St. Fursa. <clears throat> this is an Irish monk. He's originally from Ireland. He's born in Ireland. And in very much the vein of the Celtic tradition, he decides he wants to become a pilgrim for Christ. And so he uproots himself. He goes away from his homeland. He decides, I want to go and set my... Um, set my entire life at God's disposal. 
He goes over to a place in East Anglia, which is, uh, think of where Norwich is. Do y'all know, know where Norwich is? Roughly? Okay. So there's a sort of bulge. There's a bulge in England uh, that sticks out in the North Sea. That's East Anglia. So <laughs> he goes over to East Anglia and as a pilgrim for Christ, is successful at conversion. He converts a lot of people um, to Christianity. He gets sick. And he has a vision. First, he has a vision of the glory of heaven and the joys that await the faithful at their death. The next night, he has a vision of hell and the torments that await the unfaithful at their death. And so again, if we're, if we're thinking of, of Celtic Christianity as just sunshine and rainbows, it's not the whole story, because this guy is held up as one of the absolute prime examples of what a pilgrim monk ought to be. This guy's coming out of that tradition. Bede, in terms of recounting this guy's story, has this much to say about Fursa's vision of heaven. This much to say about Fursa's vision of hell and why his preaching depended upon saying, you need to watch out for the, the fire and the brimstone. So we have fire and brimstone preachers, even as far back as that. Um, so, go back to... Go <coughs> back to here. Okay, you all see where the... In the middle there, that that's a early English um, church in Nelbersburg, which <clears throat> the way that B tells it, Fursa decides he wants to live as a hermit and he wants to establish himself in a sort of secure location. And there's an abandoned Roman fortress near Nelbersburg, and you can still see the Roman walls. And he builds a small her hermitage and in Nobersburg. And to this day, there's still a church, it's still functioning as a parish church um, within the Roman ruin at Nobersburg. So again, this is what I find rather fascinating. St. Fursa is one guy, one, who builds a small little ramshackle setup near a Roman fort ruin. He gained some fame as a Christian who is good at spreading the gospel. Still a church to this day. It's basically, it, it's not St. Fursa's church, but that's a longer story. I'm not going to get into that. But it was originally, like, there's a church that's been there since around the time. I can say. So again, if we think that our Christian witness can't last for generations, but we think that somehow our ability to follow Christ cannot make a difference for generations to come, I submit to you, St. First. Now, hopefully none of y'all are going to have a dream about hell. But again, that's just sort of, you know, if we're, if we're ever in doubt that our witness cannot make a difference in the world, I would submit to you all of these different figures that we're talking about. Because... They have, and they continue to make an impact. In fact, um, Cadmon, just mentioned, is still to this day, the, the importance of that old English verse, I think it's one of three examples of the earliest uh, old English verse that we have. And I'll go back to that real quick. This, again, this is where I, I wish we had Trish here, because she could actually read it and make it sound like it's supposed to sound. Okay, the first line there. Now we shall honor heaven kingdom's war. I don't know what that says. Skill and ergen, I guess. Heaven rickes ward. Does that sound like heaven's war? Heaven's kingdom's war? Heaven kingdom's war? So again, you can sort of get this early example of what becomes the English language, which I think is rather fascinating. I think it's rather fascinating. So, okay. Um, it is now two past 
and till. So yeah. I will stop there. So St. Cuthbert. We'll pick up with St. Cuthbert next week. But again, I think I, I'm hoping that y'all remember Wilfred, the exceptionally combative prelate who wins at the Council of Whitby. As a result of winning the Council of Whitby, is granted this monastic foundation where Cuthbert and his mentor are. And they leave. So you'd think there'd be some soreness there, right? I'll leave you with that. Yeah.